My name is Michael Ondaatje, and I'm going to read from an earlier book of mine named Arnold's Ghost, which came out in uh, the year 2000. And uh, in this section, I'm focusing on some doctors in Sri Lanka, and um, especially a man named Garmini. In the operating rooms of the base hospitals in the north central province, they would run out of painkillers during the first week of any offensive. You were without self in those times, lost among the screaming. You held on to any kind of order, the smell of sablon antiseptic that was used to wash floors and walls, the children's injection room with its nursery murals. The older purpose of a hospital continued alongside the war. When Garmini finished surgery in the middle of the night, he walked through the compound in the east buildings where the sick children were. The mothers were always there, sitting on stools. They rested their upper torso and head on their child's bed and slept, holding the small hands. There were not too many fathers around then. He watched the children, who were unaware of their parents' arms. Fifty yards away, in emergency, he had heard grown men scream for their mothers as they were dying. Wait for me, I know you are here. This is when he stopped believing in man's rule on earth. He turned away from every person who stood up for a war, or the principle of one's land, or pride of ownership, or even personal rights. All of those motives ended up somehow in the arms of careless power. One was no worse and no better than the enemy. He believed only in the mothers sleeping against their children, the great sexuality of spirit in them, the sexuality of care, so the children would be confident and safe during the night. Ten beds skirted the edge of the room, and in the center was a nurse's desk. Garmini loved the order of these closed wards. If he had a few free hours, he avoided the doctor's dormitory and came here to lie on one of the empty beds, so that even if he could not sleep, he was surrounded by something he would find nowhere else in the country. He wanted a mother's arm to hold him firm on the bed, to lie across his ribcage, to bring a cool washcloth to his face. He would turn to watch a child with jaundice, bathed in the pale blue light, as if within a diorama. A blue light that was warm with a specific frequency. Pass me a gentian, give me a torch. Garmini wished to be bathed in it. The nurse looked at her watch and walked back from her desk to wake him, but he was not asleep. He drank a cup of tea with her and then left the pediatric ward, which had its own woes. Crossing the open grass lot, Garmini returned to the war rooms. He worked in the base hospital in Polonarwa, this was where the serious casualties from all over the province were brought. Family murders, outbreaks of typhoid, grenade injuries, attempted assassinations by one side or the other. The only cool place was the blood bank where the plasma was refrigerated. The only silent place was rheumatology. In the corridors of walls, building with dampness, men would be rolling giant cylinders of oxygen noisily off the carts. Oxygen was the essential river pissed into neonatal wards. Outside this room of infants and beyond the shell of the hospital building was a garrison country. The guerrillas controlled all roads after dark, so even the army didn't move at night. If there was a bombing or a village attack, they all became part of the hospital flying squad, and even those in the neonatal wards worked the triage and operating rooms. They left an intern behind. Garmini was working with Janaka Fonseca in children's surgery when they began to hear news in the corridors that a village had been attacked. In front of him on the operating table was a small boy, naked except for white shorts. The two doctors had been preparing for the operation all week. Neither of them had attempted it before. They had been reading up the text of the procedure in Kirkland's cardiac surgery over and over. They had to cool the boy's body down to 25 degrees Celsius by running cold blood into him, reducing his temperature until the heart stopped. Then they would operate. As they began, the wounded started coming into the halls, and they were aware of the flying squad in action around them. 
he and Fonseca stayed with the boy, keeping just one nurse, a heart the size of a guava. They opened the right atrium. This was as close to magic as the two of them got in their days there. They talked frantically back and forth to be certain of what they were doing. They could hear the carts carrying equipment or bodies, they couldn't tell which, racing down the halls. There had been a massacre, they now heard. A village 30 miles away had been pretty well wiped out. Somebody had to be sent there to see if there was any, anyone alive. The child in front of them had a congenital abnormality. A beautiful kid. Garmini kept wanting to look at the boy's dark black eyes, which had been full of trust, which had gazed up at him as he gave the needle that had put him into uncontrolled sleep. Fellow's tetralogy. Four things wrong with the heart. So he would live perhaps only into his early teens if they didn't operate now. A beautiful boy. Garmini was not going to leave him alone, betray him in his sleep. The operation took six hours, and all that time, Garmini stayed with the boy. He let Fonseca go after three hours. The nurse would have to help him reverse the bypass. He knew her as a starting intern, the Tamil wife of one of the staff. She and her husband had come to the hospital in the last month. Garmini stood by the boy and explained what they had to do. The boy would have to be rewarmed with blood at a higher temperature, and at the key moment, the bypass removed. So, in the fifth hour, Garmini and the nurse reversed the process that he and Fonseca set up. The young nurse watching him for any sign that what she was doing might be wrong, but she was faultless, faultless. Calmer, it seemed, than he was. Don't remain a nurse, he said. You'll be a good doctor. She was smiling under the mask. As soon as the boy was in recovery, Garmini left him with her. There was no one else he could trust. He got two beepers and told her to contact him if something went wrong. He washed up and then went into the chaos of the triage. There was blood on everyone except him now. It took a few more hours to deal with the crisis. In surgery, they wore white rubber boots and all the doors had to be closed. Sometimes if a doctor had heat exhaustion, he slipped into the refrigerated blood bank for a few minutes along with the plasma and pack cells. Garmini took over in surgery. All the survivors had been brought in by now. The killings had happened at two in the morning in a small village beside the main road to Batticolo. They had brought in nine-month-old twins, each shot in the palms and one bullet each in their right legs, so it was no accident. A close-range job, intentional, left to die. The mother had been killed. In a couple of weeks, those two children were peaceful things, full of light. You thought, what did they do to deserve this? And then, what did they do to survive this? Their wounds, in reality, quite minor, stayed with him. It was that formal evil of the act, perhaps. He didn't know. Thirty people had been massacred that morning. In the cafeteria of the base hospital, a half-hour break in his shift, a woman sat down at Garmini's table and drank her tea, ate a biscuit with him. It was about four in the morning, and he didn't know her. He just nodded to her. He felt private and too tired to talk. I helped you with an operation once, some months ago, the massacre night. His mind wheeled back a century. I thought you got transferred. Yes, I was, then I came back here. He hadn't recognized her at all. She had a mask on when he spent the crucial long hours with her over the boy. When she was not wearing a mask in pre-op, he had probably only glanced at her. Their comradeship had been mostly anonymous. You're married to someone here, right? She nodded. There was a scar at her wrist. It was new. He would have noticed that during the surgery. He looked up quickly at her face. It's very good to meet you. Yes, for me too, she said. Where did you go? He, a cough, he got stationed in Kurnagala. Garmini kept watching her, the way she was selecting the words carefully. Her face was young and lean and dark, her eyes bright as if it were daylight. Actually, I've passed you in the wards a lot. I'm sorry. No, I know you didn't recognize me. Why should you? A pause. She put a hand through her hair and then was very still. I've seen that boy. That boy, 
She looked down, smiling to herself now. The boy we operated on, I've visited him. They, they renamed the boy Garmini, the parents, after you. It was a lot of trouble, red taped, for them to do that. Good, so I have an heir. Yes, you do. I'm training now, extra hours in the children's ward. She was about to continue, then stopped. He nodded, suddenly tired. What he wanted in his life now seemed a huge thing. What he wished for would involve the lives of others, years of effort, chaos, unfairness, lying. She looked at her tea and drank the last of it. It was good to meet you. Yes. Garmini rarely saw himself from the point of view of a stranger. Though most people knew who he was, he felt he was invisible to those around him. The woman, therefore, stood alongside him and clattered about in the almost empty house of his heart. She became, as she had done that night of the operation, the sole accompanist to what he thought, what he worked on. When later he turned over the hands of a patient, he thought of the scar at her wrist, the way her fingers had slipped through her hair. What he wished to reveal to her, all that, but it was his own heart that could not step into the world. Thank you.